Before we begin, I just want to uh, remind all of you the operating room at University Hospital is making an, an effort to comply with appropriate attire regulations. There are many people who have uh, not paid particular attention to bringing things into the operating room, backpacks, bags, etc. not supposed to do that, or wearing garments that are not the hospital scrubs. So if you have you want to wear the custom scrubs that your grandmother made for you, uh, that's really not what you're supposed to wear. Uh, no jackets, no sweatshirts, no nothing other than scrubs. Okay, you wear something under your scrubs, short sleeve. If you're cold, you can get one of those blue things, but don't wear stuff in the operating room. It's not sterile. It's not clean. It's not um, appropriate, and it's not. Uh, in compliance with the standards with operating room. So just keep that in mind. My pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Ryan Marshall. He's a graduate of Purdue University, Indiana University Medical School, and did his uh, residency in general surgery at uh, Virginia Mason in Seattle before fellowship in surgical critical care and trauma here. He went into practice, a very busy uh, trauma acute care practice in Lincoln, Nebraska for a few years. We were fortunate to uh, attract him back to uh, the place of his fellowship to um, play a, an important role in our trauma, critical care, acute care surgery program, where he's already become incredibly busy. Uh, Dr. Marshall has some real world experience. He's going to share with us and talk to us about acute care surgery this morning. Dr. Marshall, thank you. Everybody here. This is, appreciate that, uh, Dr. McMasters, um, and good morning to everybody. Um, you know, this early in the academic year, all the uh, residents are leveling up. The medical students are transitioning from preclinical to clinical ward um, service. Thought it would be good to give kind of a high-ranging and broad, clinically focused talk about you know, an issue uh, or a, a discipline that's near and dear to my heart, which is emergency general surgery. Uh, most of what I do here, in addition to trauma. Um, it is an ambitious agenda. There's nine topics. I didn't do 10 because I'm not a big David Letterman fan. And, um, uh, but did think that we can go through nine sort of important uh, and sort of emerging topics. You know, there's not a lot of very new avant-garde uh, research happening in a lot of acute care surgery, but I think there are some germane and relevant things that we can discuss. Uh, so we'll try to stay on time so I can avoid the shepherd's crook at the end. I have uh, no disclosures. Oh, yeah. That you guys see that too. Okay, we all got it. Cool. Uh, so we'll review some standards of care, um, some relevant uh, historical and, and more current literature, and then some emerging uh, trends and some controversies and areas that we can uh, inquire and do better by our patients in the future. So I really love acute care surgery, fell in love with it early on in my residency um, for a lot of reasons, but three of which you see here. Uh, ACS kind of came into being about 20 years ago when um, surgery departments and hospitals felt that it might be more efficient um, to have a dedicated team doing a lot of the on-call surgery rather than the attendings that would take the consults overnight and then he or she would clear the cases the following day. Um, I really love the breadth of clinical and operative experiences. I think in ACS, a lot of the things that we read and heard about in preclinical years in medical school, you actually see you know, with regularity. It's really instantly gratifying and the majority of cases, the patients tend to be very appreciative. Um, there's surgical problems that, that you see, and it's very gratifying to fix those quickly. And I think like trauma, it's non-discriminatory. We see patients from all walks of life, and I think that's a great thing and uh, something that I really enjoy about the job. So, you know, one, one concern um, that we're seeing sort of in healthcare today is just centralization of care, and um, it's becoming more and more specialized and regionalized. So this is a slide that may look familiar because it was in Dr. Uh, Perrin Cobb's uh, great grand rounds talk a couple weeks ago. I, I promised that the slide made its way into my talk privately before he gave it publicly. Um, but this shows a, a map of US population density um, with darker being more populous, superimposed with a bunch of um, brown uh, data points. And these are dots representing uh, an EGS hospital. So every single uh, one of these is a hospital that has 24 hour surgical, uh, ER and OR uh, capabilities, as well as ICU beds. And you'll notice a couple things from this chart. Number one, you see how densely populated hospitals are in areas with higher population. But you'll, if you squint and look at it for a while, you'll also notice that there's 
fairly large areas that are both populated and not highly populated um, that don't have a lot of hospital coverage. I, I saw this really starkly at my last job in Lincoln, Nebraska at a pretty busy level two doing a lot of ACS there. We had patients that were hundreds of miles away from any hospital that could even see you in the emergency room, let alone you know get you in for an appendectomy. I routinely had patients coming into the hospital via helicopter for an appendectomy, which is really amazing. Um, there was a lot of discussions on the phone about whether we have to do this, whether we don't have to do this, and we'll get back to that. But it really is a problem for a lot of a lot of folks in this country uh, as you know hospitals are closing down in these critical access areas. So ideally, you want to have you know roughly seven and a half surgeons for 100,000 people. Currently, we're about one surgeon uh, less than that, and rurally, we're about three surgeons less than that. Um, you know, the median uh, population of a county in the country is only about 25,000. 90% of counties with double that population lack any hospital that can provide acute care surgical care. This uh, is associated with, in many cases, racial, socioeconomic, educational disparities, and is a real problem in, in these less densely populated areas. And COVID has really just kind of, uh, you know, sort of gaslit this even further. You can see this picture, which is a very common sort of visual and in really any emergency room in, in Louisville right now. I mean, it's just very busy. The system is still stressed and we really haven't recovered from the um, uh, sort of the, the correction that's come with a lot of these hospitals closing. So this has led to more what we call regionalization or centralization of a lot of healthcare, but specifically uh, surgical care. This has already kind of happened to some degree, you know, before ACS it happened in cancer care. There was a lot of high level evidence that, you know, cancer surgery outcomes were better in areas where they do a lot of it. Uh, but this is starting to move more towards the ACS model as well, but I think uh, less, uh, probably more organically and less purposefully. Um, but there is a focus on availability, efficiency, throughput. We can streamline care uh, in models that are similar to, you know, sort of well-known like heart attack and stroke pathways. Like if you have a, uh, you know, a, a, a heart attack in Ogallala, Nebraska, I mean, there's like an established pathway to get you somewhere quickly, but there isn't one if you have a surgical emergency. Um, there's some limited evidence that outcomes are, are potentially better in centralized centers. That makes intuitive sense. The literature tells us that the inflection point for this is about 600 ACS patients a year. And I think that with fewer hospitals doing more, more of this care, it makes intuitive sense that there's an opportunity for more consolidated QI, things like NISQIP or TQIP on the trauma side, surgeon-specific registries, and et cetera. This all comes at a cost, though. A lot of it is economic cost. Um, you know, transporting these patients is really expensive, whether it's by helicopter, which is an extreme circumstance, or just by ambulance. You know, we talk a lot about futile transfers. This is a source of frustration on the ACS service currently. That's defined as a patient uh, or an encounter where they come um, often a far distance, and then nothing happens to them procedurally for 72 hours, and then they're discharged. And maybe we can cut down on these, and that cuts down on a lot of waste. Bed availability and Urban centers is a major issue, um, especially post-pandemic, and now it's not even because of the pandemic. Um, I don't believe that in centers that want to do high-quality surgical care that are rural, I don't believe that the care is inferior, but you can imagine a circumstance where, you know, if hospitals are getting used to sending even straightforward run-of-mill general surgery cases, we get to a spot where these hospitals really don't take care of any surgical cases, and it's a um, sort of a feedback loop that continues and perpetuates. The patients often do not love this. Their experiences, their communication, a lot of the follow-up is often suffering as a result of the long distances that they travel. Um, I think it's easy to say yes on the phone to somebody who may be morbidly obese and comorbid to have their Hartman's done you know, 200 miles away. But when they have their inevitable wound complication, I think that's associated with a lot of trips back and forth. And you know, I think all of us that do clinic regularly hear a lot about this because it's a real issue. So these are a lot of, you know, mostly opinions, not fact-based, but I do think we should embrace appropriate regionalization of care. Um, I think we should try to cut down on waste throughout though. Futile transfers, what we call palliative transfers, which often happens in trauma and acute care surgery, where patients really just needed a frank goals of care discussion um, uh, rather than, you know, transferring hundreds of miles to have other doctors have the same discussion. Um, this leads to issues with their loved ones at end of life, um, not being able to be with the, um, with the patient as well. Um, one of my personal pet peeves is a transfer from a facility that has surgical capabilities when the surgeon did not evaluate the patient him or herself. And then I, I do think that we should try to do better um, globally with having discussions about what the post-op follow-up plan is. And I've had really good rural surgeons say, hey, like we cannot deal with X problem, but I am happy to 
sort of re-engage and, and, and do Y and Z after, after you guys do what needs to be done. I think there's some tools to mitigate this. One is telemedicine, um, and then another one is surgical risk calculators, which are useful tools at um, um, giving some objective data about you know, expected post-operative course, morbidity, mortality. So we're gonna move to a different topic, another one that's probably a newer and late, later breaking one, which is robotics and acute care surgery. So um, the history of uh, robotic surgery is kind of wide ranging and I'm not gonna get into all of it, but it's pretty fascinating if you have a chance to read into it. It involves collaborative research um, between the Defense Department, NASA and DARPA for telepresence and, and um, the robotic technology that we, we utilize today. And then in 1995, Frederick Mall, who was um, parenthetically a graduate of my program in Seattle previously, founded Intuitive Surgical and that was the first real foray um, that became ubiquitous with this technology. It, they first tried to integrate it into cardiothoracic surgery, which is an interesting choice. It didn't go particularly well. Um, turns out it's hard to integrate a new technology when you're um, working on a dynamically beating heart. Um, but it did catch on with other surgical disciplines. It really caught on with the urologist doing prostatectomies, which makes intuitive sense. And then it did catch on with transplant, donor nephrectomies, low pelvic dissection and gynecology, um, thoracic oncology. And then it kind of exploded from there. And they're really isn't a discipline today. There's really not a surgical fellowship that you could do that doesn't have people in, in this country doing something on the robot, even breast surgery, uh, endocrine surgery, they're doing transaxillary uh, thyroidectomies, believe it or not, it's impo almost impossible to imagine, but really there's no, no discipline that doesn't integrate the technology. But the, the harder thing is integrating the technology for on-call cases. It's easy to plan for something and have the robot available, but how do you integrate that into on-call cases and how appropriate is that? We're gonna talk about that briefly. Has anyone ever heard of the Limburg operation? Raise your hand if you have. Cool, there's a good reason for it. Um, this is a surgeon from Strasbourg, uh, France. That's in the, I think the Northeast corner of France on the German border. Um, he's doing a, a, a coli, a lap coli on a patient from Strasbourg, but interestingly, he's doing it from New York. Um, even more interesting is that, you know, if I would have told you this, I, if I would have guessed, I would have said this happened like three years ago or, or last week. It actually happened in September of 2001. And we didn't hear much about it because uh, Al Qaeda knocked down the Twin Towers a couple of days later. Um, pretty amazing achievement, not just for telemedicine, telepresence, but also with the, the technology of fiber optic cables and communication. Uh, after that aside, so we're going to go into some robotic applications that we use for on-call general surgery. Uh, this is an incomplete list, and the list is continuing to expand. But you know, we can we can do this essentially for almost any case that you can visualize or do laparoscopically. Um, in general, I think we find the most benefit from the robot in um, you know highly comorbid patients and obese patients, where the 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 added degrees of freedom of the technology allow you to to work in spaces with. Uh, uh, with more ease and hopefully ward off the incidence of having to do a big open operation. This includes fecal diversion, complicated and uncomplicated diverticulitis, segmental colectomies for bleeding, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, bowel perforations. Um, and then after the patient convalesces, I think the concept of doing a, an acute appendicitis on the robot is frankly somewhat ridiculous, but I do think that in select cases, doing an interval apnea on the robot can be helpful because these patients often need a visceral rotation uh, or extensive adhesial lysis. And then in some selected patients, I think they really do benefit from a colostomy takedown done on the robot. And we'll talk about that in a second. So I really think that some of the benefits of on-call robotics are patient level, and some of them are sort of like population and, and educational level. Um, per patient, um, I think that there's a, a large improvement in selected cases with analgesia, incision size, um, especially in larger patients. Uh, these patients often have shorter return of bowel function. And then as a result, if they get out of the hospital sooner, the trade-off of increased operative utilization of resources can hopefully be outweighed by the decreased utilization of hospital resources. Um, I think a major benefit, probably the most major benefit is a reduction of hernia risk and wound complications. I found in uh, my sort of private practice gig in Nebraska that the robot was also really beneficial because the technology is much better for visualization. With the pandemic, the OR was always short staffed. We, we were having a hard time acquiring um, good assistance in the OR and the camera is just much better for visualization. You can control everything yourself. You don't have to rely on somebody else to sort of help you with the case like we do in an educational environment. Speaking of education though, I, I think that there's a ton of potential for educational improvements uh, you know, with the robot. You know, When we do a lap coli, you know, all the staff and the 
the residents that do coleys can imagine this. Like, let's say you're doing a coley as an R2 or an R3, and you're just not in the right plane. The attending doesn't like what you're doing. There's usually some grunting, and then eventually it's a switch sides. And uh, then there's that walk of shame for both of us as we move to the other side of the table. Um, everyone's been there. I've been there. You guys will be there. Um, you know, we love it. With the dual console, um, I think a lot of that's just gone. I mean, I can draw with telestration, tele-illustration, um, where the plane is. If they're not in the right plane, and then the resident um, can can do it. And then if he or she is still struggling, then we can take the the control for a very brief period of time and then give it back when it's appropriate. And actually, really powerfully, this can be tracked. So there's a lot of studies that are showing that you know you can track how much time the resident is spending doing the case versus the staff. This can be tracked with phone apps and and there's a lot of power with that. Obviously, there's improved ergonomics and visualization. You imagine if you do a thousand coleys in your career or two thousand, you know, there's a there's two thousand like this, and you're sweating and you're grunting, and then there's two thousand like this. You can imagine at least on that level how that's improved from an ergonomic perspective. I talked about the visualization. You know, surgeons, I think some of us are good and some of us, including me, are not. You know, surgeons don't do a great job of video analysis. So, you know, high-level athletes and other professionals will videotape themselves and get coaching. Surgeons, we really haven't done a lot of that. Um, you know, I think that we should all be probably doing more of that, you know, videotaping ourselves and then doing, you know, debriefing after. I, I watch a lot of surgical videos, even on YouTube, as crazy as that sounds. I've learned a lot from that from watching really high-level surgeons uh, perform these robotic cases. And I think that there's a, a great potential for us to videotape ourselves and videotape the residents doing these cases, and then we can sort of debrief, and you can basically experience the case, maybe not twice, but like one and a half times over. And then I think if we do the, you know, if we do robotic cases, which often are, let's face it, a lot of them can be simpler cases, cholecystectomies or um, fecal diversion. If these can be done on the robot, I, I think this can flatten the learning curve for our residents to use the technology when they go forth for more co complicated cases. You know, if one of our chiefs, you know, does a hundred lap coles, is that chief, is he or she going to benefit more from doing a hundred and first lap cole versus doing maybe their first robotic cholecystectomy? I think it allows for learning of this technology, which is not going away. Um, and I think will be something that pays dividends for these residents down the road. So endocyanine green um, is a technology we're utilizing on the robot. It uh, came into uh, prevalence you know, 30, 40 years ago. A lot of times in East Asia, it was used for um, an assay to assess hepatic function for you know, cancer, surgery, stage hepatectomies, things of that like. It has a IV half-life of three minutes. It's excreted into the biliary tree and then cleared enterically. And we can utilize these, um, this, uh, these properties to our benefit on the robotic apparatus. So this is a case that we did on the ACS service over at Jewish Hospital only a couple of weeks ago. This is an 84-year-old man who had Hartman's anatomy that we had operated on several months prior. And um, we took him back and, and did a colostomy takedown on the robot. So you can see on the left, that's the normal uh, view robotically sort of at the left pelvis. And then you can see we you know, asked our urology colleagues to stent the ureters and um, inject ICG one milligram. And then this is the visualization that results. Um, he turned out not to have a ton of adhesions. I don't think that he benefited as much from the ICG ureterography as I have, I've had patients benefit from previously, but you can see the, the power of this to, to visualize. It's not been shown to reduce the incidence of a ureteral injury, just as ureteral stents have not been shown to reduce the incidence of a ureteral transection in open surgery. But I do think that the haptic feedback for the latter and the visual feedback for the former do move these cases along in reoperative surgery or in acute inflammation because it gives you some surety that you are staying away from trouble. We also can inject ICG intravascularly and then measure perfusion analysis even a minute or two later. So this is um, the same case on the left. You see the left colon conduit with the anvil for the EEA stapler uh, extruding. And then on the right, you see the coloproctostomy with the anvil mated to the EEA, and this is before the, the stapler was fired. So at each case, we gave one milligram of ICG. We asked anesthesia to, to give that and then uh, check the perfusion. And again, hard to validate this prospectively as it is hard to validate for the, uh, the SPI technology on the plastic side with their flaps. But, but I do think it can be helpful, uh, especially in an octogenarian. This patient did really well had um, return of bowel function on post-operative day two and left the hospital shortly thereafter. Um, full disclosure, these are not my operative photos. I took like 20 or 30 of these from Nebraska, but they somehow didn't make their way to Lincoln. So these are stock photos that I got from the internet. My son must've like shredded them up and ate them or something. I don't know where they are. Um, 
but you can see the ICG can also be used if you inject it anywhere from two hours to two days before surgery, you can see the ICG claim geography. I, I don't think that this is uh, an equal substitute to a digital subtraction cholangiogram. It really has not been validated to show if there's a distal biliary obstruction. So it's not the same thing, but can define anatomy, especially if it's anomalous anatomy. You can see on the right side that were they clipped and transected, that's actually an aberrant um, uh, biliary uh, anomaly. They, they think that it's a duplicated cystic duct. It looks to me like maybe it's a, an aberrant right uh, 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 bile duct. Um, but I do think that this could potentially identify pitfalls such as this. The other thing I'll point out is on uh, photo left, that patient probably received ICG the day before surgery because there's no interference in the background with the liver that you see on the right side. So these are different ways that we've utilized this technology. I think it can be beneficial. I don't think it's by itself a reason to, to use the robot. There are good adjuncts that I've, I've found useful personally. So there's definitely barriers to implementing the robot. There's, you know, obviously with it being a new technology, the, the robot is expensive. Um, so there's direct cost. There's also the economy of time, training everybody up, docking and undocking, the increased operative time from trainees and from staff that use it. And then obviously there's barriers with the limited technology on a daily basis. So, um, you know, definitely a work in progress, but something we're trying to integrate more on the ACS service line. All right, moving to the next topic, another one that I'm pretty passionate about, which is uh, safe cholecystectomy. So we do about 1.2 million cholecystectomies, not a Jewish hospital. We do about 600,000 in Jewish, but we do 1.2 million in the country. Um, uh, you know, that's a large number of patients and encounters, and the risk of bile duct injury is relatively low, anywhere from 0.2 to 0.6%, they think. But that's still a, a large number of very morbid um, injuries that are life-threatening. And anything we can do to reduce that incidence is going to benefit a large number of patients. And the Society of GI and Endocrine Surgeons has come up with a validated uh, module called safe cholecystectomy. It's free for anybody in this room to access. And they have six identified uh, things that are likely to reduce BDI incidence. And one is critical view of safety. One is understanding aberrant anatomy, liberal usage of cholangiography, pausing before cutting anything to make sure that you're um, sort of on a level, uh, you know, on the level with everything that you see with your anatomy, recognizing when things are dangerous and you're at an, uh, a zone of significant risk and halt. If it's too dangerous, find another way out of the operating room other than completing the cholecystectomy. And then really importantly, asking for help when things don't make sense or they're difficult. So this is the critical view of safety. You can see a picture of it on the left and then a, a intraoperative photograph of it on the right. Um, you know, uh, on the ACS service, the residents often dictate the op notes, but if you ever notice, a, you know, if you're on my service and you'll see my dictations, I always say the same thing. It's a dot phrase that I use and it's, you know, the critical view of safety. When one third of cystic plate is exposed and the duct is clear to fat, two and only two structures were entering the gallbladder and these were each taken with two clips on the stay side. I always say it and I think it should be something standardized in 2023 for people doing this operation. Um, they've actually found that not standardizing that language actually can be associated with an increased incidence of bile duct injury and lawsuit. So, um, you know, what happens if you can't uh, get a critical view of safety? Do we just cut things? Of course not. So you have options. One is to abort the operation. One is to just place a drain, a foley into the fundus of the gallbladder, for example. One is to open like the bearded Marshall is doing here. Um, and one is to do a subtotal cholecystectomy, which is something that has become more and more ubiquitous in the last 10 years. And I'm gonna discuss briefly. So the left side is a picture of what we call a uh, fenestrating subtotal cholecystectomy. And then the right side is what we call a reconstituting uh, subtotal cholecystectomy. I think there's a couple important distinctions. On the left side, we basically bivalve the gallbladder where we know it's safe, resect necrotic tissue, try to extract stones um, that may be inspissated, leave a drain, and then uh, close. On the right side, it's basically the same thing. Sometimes you can resect the back wall of the gallbladder, uh, but importantly, you try to either purse string or stitch close the cystic duct orifice. One approach has not been shown to be superior to the other. I think you're trading the risk of a biliary fistula or a leak um, with the risk of a reconstituted gallbladder in the future because you don't know exactly how much of that you're leaving behind. I tend to perform the fenestrating uh, because I think we have good access to ERCP. And I think that's a relatively uh, good trade-off, um, but others have, have closed it. I don't, I don't feel strongly that one's superior to the other. Um, do you have to close the remnant? Again, we're trading bile leak versus you know, the risk of reconstitution of the gallbladder and stone disease. I've had one patient um, who's still uh, lingering, I think in Seward, Nebraska, who's got a, a stone disease after we did a subtotal and he's 
is his colic symptoms every several months and is managing that okay. Um, I think the bigger question is, you know, whether you should open or do a lap subtotal. And that's a tough decision that I think depends a lot on the patient and the surgeon's intraoperative judgment. So I think that an older infirm patient probably is somebody I'm more likely to do a lap subtotal on to avoid the morbidity of an open surgery. I think someone who's younger has more years to benefit from not having recurrent disease or somebody who's leaner and a better candidate for an open approach is probably somebody I'm likely to do a coker incision on and try to get the whole thing out. But I think it's important to remember why the patient's in the OR. So, you know, we've all seen these coles on call that are like, you know, radioactive green or green as gumby because the gallbladder is dead. I think it's important. Those patients really don't, don't necessarily need 100% of their gallbladder resected. They just need source control of their gangrene. So remember why you're there and then try to avoid doing an open subtotal. Yes, I know people in my service, we just did one a couple of weeks ago, but we want to try to avoid these because if you are opening the patient, you want to try and get the whole thing out. We'll shift to appendicitis. I wish every appendix looked like that one. Um, Raise your hand if you think, do we have to operate on acute appendicitis? I noticed a couple of hands went up after yours, sir. Uh, should appendectomy remain the standard of care? This is where you put, everyone puts their hands up. Yeah, okay, good. We're gonna talk about this briefly. So there's a couple of trials that I think you should be aware of. So there's the antibiotic therapy versus appendectomy trial. This is APAC, it was done in Scandinavia, 2015, 500 plus patients randomized to surgery versus appendectomy. They looked at, um, you know, discharge without appendicitis or without, sorry, discharge without requiring appendectomy and the antibiotic only arm. So they had about a 72% success rate of this. 70 out of 250 some patients underwent appendectomy in a crossover fashion. So they crossed over from the drug only arm to needing an appendectomy. And then on the surgery side, one early mortality, that's bad. Uh, they found four invasive cancers. Well, that's bad for the patient, but good for surgery. Two incisional hernias and 24 surgical site infections. The patients that had surgery stayed in the hospital about a half day shorter on average, but they tended to take longer to return to work. I do think that that may be a reflection of labor practices between the United States and Europe more than maybe the, the actual trial. But what if I told you, you know, I think all these results at least show that surgery is equivalent or probably superior depending on your, your worldview and your bias. But what if I told you that all the appendectomies in this trial, except for four of them, were done open, even in 2015? I think that would probably skew your, your bias towards probably saying, hey, maybe if we can do it minimally invasively, this is probably better. So this is probably one of the most important surgery papers in the last 20 years, it's a prospective randomized trial, the CODA trial, comparing outcomes in drugs and appendectomy, very similar uh, construct as the APAC trial, but three times the patients, they looked at quality of life scoring. This was the same between treatment arms at 30 days. So that's kind of the big takeaway that some ERs are using to justify just putting patients on antibiotics definitively. But certain terms and restrictions apply. So, um, you know, secondary outcomes. So about three in 10 patients actually crossed over and needed appendectomy by 90 days. That mirrors the APAC trial. And these patients had higher complication rates and severe complication rates were also higher in the uh, intervention arm, which is the antibiotic only arm. Furthermore, we were able to identify the patients that are at high risk for antibiotic and medical treatment failure. So these are called appendicolis or fecalis. This is insufficient uh, stones at the base of the appendix, which caused the obstruction. And this was a, a very high uh, risk factor for failure of antibiotic therapy. So 41% of these patients failed treatment and they did worse with complications and hazard ratio of near six. So you can see the red on this curve is actually the patients that had stones and the blue is the ones that did not. And I think it's pretty clear that certainly in patients that have a stone, they should be getting an appendectomy. But what do we, what do we take in these studies sort of in total? And there are others too. Definitive antibiotic therapy, I think is a safe option. I, I, I don't mean to be dismissive of that, that option, but I think surgery is still the standard of care. Appendectomies are relatively low morbidity operations. There's very high crossover rates, and especially in patients that have appendicolis, there's an unacceptably high risk profile. Uh, patients should be counseled. Um, I think it's good to tell patients that in 2023, we can certainly try to treat this with antibiotics, but surgery remains standard of care. And I think that should be probably the way that this is phrased to patients when counseling them about surgery, because I still remain convinced surgery is a better option for the vast majority of people. We're going to switch gears and talk about mesh. So um, this guy on the left is Francis Usher, Francis Cowgill Usher. Um, it's not Harry Truman, nor is it uh, Gary Oldman, who plays Harry Truman in Oppenheimer. 
Um, he was the first surgeon to use polypropylene mesh first in dogs in the 1950s and then starting in around the 1960s in humans. You know, in terms of mesh, it can be kind of overwhelming, especially as a, uh, a junior resident or as a medical student, but there's really this Punnett square that comes with mesh. So first question is, is synthetic or biologic? Synthetic is almost exclusively polypropylene these days. PTFE was used. It kind of fell out of vogue because it was uh, more prone to infection, particularly with M MRSA. And the other half of the Punnett square is macroporous or microporous. So macroporous is a lightweight mesh. Microporous is a heavyweight mesh. You can see the difference in these up here. You can see with the heavyweight meshes that have smaller pore sizes, um, there's less potential for intercalation of natural tissue and mesh incorporation. You can intuitively imagine how this makes meshes less resistant to infection and harder to integrate into uh, to in vivo tissue. So, you know, the pendulum has swung back and forth for the past, you know, 40, 50 years, I guess 30, 40 years with how aggressive should we be about placing synthetic mesh, how much more effective is synthetic mesh for establishing abdominal domain. And this is still an area of ongoing controversy. Uh, our medical center has a, a rich history of research in this realm. So this is a pretty uh, famous and off-sided paper from Annals of Surgery uh, done by many of the surgical giants we have here, including one in the room, Dr. Polk, about uh, emergency abdominal wall reconstruction with polypropylene mesh. Um, I think the subtitle kind of says it all. So short-term benefits versus long-term complications. So they, they took 30 patients, 31 patients that had uh, grossly contaminated wounds for various emergency general surgery and trauma and necrotizing soft tissue infection insults and placed Marlex mesh, which is polypropylene mesh, um, they had good early results um, in terms of reestablishing abdominal domain, but over time there was mesh erosion, fistula um, requirement for explantation, um, and even um, uh, component separations and flat coverage. So this kind of characterized the, the issues that come with using the synthetic mesh. It's better at reestablishing domain, but uh, over time it can lead to morbidity with these patients. Um, the pendulum started to swing from there into the 90s and into the 2000s and around Y2K, biologic meshes were really in vogue. Um, theoretically, there's a lot of uh, pros to these. Um, they incorporate into tissue. Uh, they think better than, than synthetic meshes because they're scaffolds of tissue matrices. They're infection resistant, safer for placement and contaminated fields for these reasons. But they were thought and are still thought to uh, lead to increased hernia recurrence risks. And of course, like anything, they're expensive. There's many options. You can see uh, ovine, uh, porcine, bovine options, and there's even other uh, human options, not from the Vitruvian man, but from more contemporary humans. So, um, you know, there's many options out there that can get overwhelming, but I think just looking at this as a category of basically uh, biologic or bio meshes is more helpful. So this was, you know, still an area of debate, and this is a pretty important paper from Rosen et al. Um, from JAMA Surgery last year. They randomized 250 plus hernias in clean contaminated cases. So for the students, that's a case where there's transection of the GI tract, maybe some controlled spillage or planned spillage uh, while doing an anastomosis or, you know, an open coli, for example, but not gross fecal spillage or contamination. Um, they randomized these patients to synthetic or biologic mesh. This was all placed in a retrorectus position, which is also the epidemic for that is a stopa operation. Um, the primary outcome was hernia recurrence, either clinically or radiographically by two years. So biologic had a 21% or 20.5%, synthetic was 5.6. If you subtract the latter from the former, that's an absolute risk reduction of about 15%. You take one over 0 0.15, you get seven repairs needed to be done with a synthetic mesh to ward off a, a biologic recurrence. Um, they found important, just as importantly, found no difference in surgical site complications or, or interventions, uh, you know, particularly with infection. Uh, but of course, there were substantial cost differences. One mesh is basically the same mesh that was put in by uh, Francis Usher, you know, 60 years ago. And the other one is something that's being aggressively marketed by, you know, a, a rep uh, on a daily basis. So um, these were the takeaways from the study. You can see kind of the Kaplan-Meier plot for hernia recurrence right here. So Pretty convincing that at least in uh, this population, it's safe and more um, higher efficacy to place the synthetic mesh. But maybe we can do even better. So there were, you know, there was that Punnett square of or that dichotomy of uh, synthetic mesh and then biologic mesh. Now there's these composite or hybrid meshes. So that's a tissue scaffold of some type. This one is sheep um, with a synthetic weave of polypropylene, as you see here. 
Um, so these are being placed more and more, not just here, but sort of nationally and internationally. And early results have been fairly promising, more, more durable hernia repairs, um, fewer explantations required for mesh infections, and, and higher rates of mesh salvage, which is what we would call a situation where you have a known infection of the mesh, where you're able to clear it without needing to explant the mesh. Um, the caveat is this data, uh, these data are predominantly from industry-funded series, so you have to take that with a grain of salt, but the results have so far been, at least anecdotally and in, in, in a limited fashion, uh, data-driven promising. Um, the use of these in infected cases, cases is anecdotally increasing here and elsewhere, and I think we need to do more research on this and, and get some more data, but this has been sort of a, a way in which the pendulum seems to be swinging back. Moving on, so this is, I think, an, an underappreciated aspect of surgery and medicine globally. So, you know, we're in the midst of an explosion of use with these uh, GLP-1 agonists. GLP stands for glucagon-like peptide. Um, you know, even when I stepped on my scale yesterday, it didn't even give a number. It just said Ozempic question mark. So, um, you know, these medications and, you know, for the students, you guys all just took step one and did your GI peptides. I'm sure you guys have some of that still seared into your memory, probably better than a lot of us do, but it's confusing because glucagon like peptide you would think is glucagon, but it actually potentiates insulin because why would you name it anything else? You know, it's, it makes total intuitive sense, but it, it potentiates a physiologic fed state. Uh, it increases insulin sensitivity and secretion slows gastric emptying and gut motility, we'll get back to that. And then also is thought to confer other end organ protections. It really sounds too good to be true. And maybe it is, we'll talk about it. But um, some examples include semaglutide, tirzepatide, and dulaglutide. And these are some of the end organ effects that you see. Actually, it, it works even in the myocardium and they think in the hypothalamus, um, uh, really, and, and can be protective of the kidneys even. So these were first developed on label for diabetes management, and then were are increasingly being utilized first off label, now on label for obesity and metabolic syndrome. Um, FDA approval for the first one was in 2021. The EU Regulatory Commission, which is the FDA of uh, the, our, our European colleagues across the pond, that was in 2022. The usage is skyrocketing. So. Um, you know, I first started hearing about this. Uh, my dad's a pharmacist. And he he started talking about you know how these things are going to be like the in drugs in you know four or five years. And he started talking about this a few years ago. Um, you can see average number of prescription refills or known prescription refills per month in the United States of the different drugs over there, and these are pretty staggering numbers. Um, some of them are injections. Um, there are pill options, and there's about to be more pill options. But the usage is skyrocketing, and there's even more off label. Um, things coming down the pike. So again, it's thought to be helpful for impulsive behavior and addiction in addition to weight loss and metabolic syndrome. So with increasing numbers of patients using these drugs or any drug, we have to kind of consider the ramifications for our population, which is the surgical population. So one thing is delayed gastric emptying. So the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the most powerful group of anesthesiologists in this country, they issued a consensus statement very recently saying that GLP-1 agonists can um, increase the likelihood of an aspiration event, and they recommended stopping these drugs over a week before surgery. This is particularly relevant for emergency general surgery because we are seeing patients that didn't know they had a problem a week ago. So these patients um, are at high risk for an aspiration event, not just with induction, but also with a bowel obstruction, for example. Um, these patients are, are more likely to aspirate. So we need to be, be careful for this. Other concerns, you know, with reduced motility of the gut, there's constipation, gastroenteritis, you know, a very common consult that we see on ACS and really in all the hospitals is, you know, we have somebody that we think might have an SBO, we get called about it, it's not too impressive radiographically. Uh, and we're kind of in this like, you know, is it an ileus, is it a bowel obstruction, is it a gastroenteritis, is it an Ogilvy syndrome? And I think that this is just gonna further confound things. I think we're gonna probably have to start asking more and more of, of our patients whether they're taking these drugs. Um, this picture on the right is actually from a, a study they did over in East Asia on rats where they were able to demonstrate that the rats that took these medications over time had reduced functional intestinal length because the, the bowel became inelastic and hard. And actually they found a high incidence of true mechanical bowel obstruction. So this hasn't been seen in humans yet because we haven't studied it in humans that long, but I think in post-marketing surveillance, we need to be careful about um, you know, whether these patients are having a higher risk of bowel obstruction also. The medication is intended to cause you to feel full and to not eat, and that leads to not just calorie malnutrition, which is marasmus, but also protein malnutrition, which is quashiocre. And we know sarcopenia and sarcopenic obesity are known risk factors for poor perioperative and postoperative outcomes. 
poor wound, wound healing, uh, anastomotic breakdown, fistula, nosocomial infection, all the things we talk about. So this is uh, a spot of bother for us with, with doing cases that already can be very high risk. And then I do think this is more editorializing, but we, we see patients that are losing weight rapidly in the bariatric population. They often have increased incidence of gallstones. Uh, some bariatric surgeons controversially are doing uh, concomitant cholecystectomies with their bypasses. I think we're going to see more cholestasis and maybe an increased incidence and virulence of gallstone disease with this in our population. So these are things that I think we should keep in mind. And by no means is this a complete uh, list and I think is an area that we need to study further. Moving on. Um, so a common uh, area of contention uh, on the ACS surface is how long should we wait to do a case? So we go add a case on the board, all the residents in the back probably can relate to this. And you're told something like, does it have to go now? Which we don't like to hear. Uh, a better way to phrase it is why should it wait to go later? So, um, you know, there's not a great amount of data on this, but I think there's some, and really it's how many hours, how many sunsets. Of course, there's the economy of time on our standpoint too. You know, we're doing a lot of cases, things are very busy and we need to prioritize and triage. So we're going to kind of dive into this quickly for a couple of common situations. Bowel obstruction. So the East uh, Association of Surgery and Trauma Guidelines um, say that you should not manage an adhesive bowel obstruction non-operatively for more than five days. Of course, this is throwing out patients that have hard indications to go sooner. But this is not a binary choice you make in a vacuum. There's patient morbidity to account for. We have patients that have cirrhosis and there's cardiac cripples and other patients that really are very sick and wouldn't do well with an operation. And we'll space those patients out even further before surrendering and doing the, the surgery. Uh, there's compounding diagnosis, which we just talked about. But we know that there's been a gradual decrement in outcomes with longer trials of non-operative management because we're getting more aggressive over time with managing bowel obstructions non-operatively. A uh, recent study of uh, multiple centers, over 20,000 patients showed that if you wait more than three non-operative days, um, even if appropriately so, you know, these patients have a 1.6 hazard ratio for death and they have a higher risk of staying in the hospital longer, usually because of delayed return of bowel function. So, you know, it's important to separate out which patients need to go, and which patients don't. Um, but also, you know, if you have a patient that's clearly failing non-operative management uh, on day two, three, and four, they're probably not going to do better on day five, but they probably will do worse if you wait. Uh, for appendicitis, so this is going to tie into a previous talking point, but if we're operating, I think we should do it as soon as logistically feasible. Does that mean we drive into the hospital in the middle of the night to do an appy? It might if the patient's sick. We don't typically do that if it's a stable patient. Uh, but the problem is defining what urgency is on a patient level, on a surgeon level, and an institution level. Um, there's really not great data. Uh, it's all retrospective and it conflicts. There's some evidence that appendectomies can be delayed by up to 24 hours, but as we talked about previously, there's also evidence that appendectomies can be delayed indefinitely. So that's kind of a not, not a great data point that we should be quoting. Um, other evidence that ACS models can reduce the time to appendectomy and that reduces the likelihood of perforation and complications. This is a trial that's enrolling now in Finland. Um, it's accruing patients that are randomized to one of two arms. They have acute superlative appendicitis that's not perforated. They're either getting surgery urgently within six to eight hours, they're getting it within 24 hours. And the metric that they're tracking primarily is the incidence of perforation, which I think is a good metric um, because that's often what we wonder about clinically if we wait is whether the appendicitis is going to perforate. We're also doing, you know, Dr. Cheadle is doing research here on uh, post-operative antibiotic usage in appendicitis. I think there's a lot more to come on, on these factors, which are fairly run-of-mill operations, but very common uh, issues I think we can benefit patients by, by learning more about the uh, management of these diseases. Cholecystitis was historically thought at various points to either be not an emergency or an emergency. Um, subsequently, some research out of Japan, when they came up with the Tokyo classification, uh, it developed and said very early cholecystitis or mild, we should operate up front. And if they present with severe grade, um, then we did a delayed cholecystectomy in a similar fashion to appropriate appendicitis. Um, some research uh, sort of in the last decade showed that this really didn't need to happen and that we should just try to do acute cholecystitis as it comes in, even if they've sat on their symptoms for a while. And this has sort of evolved into a standard of care within most ACS models nationally. So these are some various factors that we consider in terms of like when to do the surgery. But I think in general, you should do the operation as, as safely, uh, as quickly as you can and safely feasible. Should they go at nighttime? That's a difficult question. Um, to answer or even more difficult to study, but there's different competing aims. So there's the benefit to the patient of doing the surgery sooner uh, with the potential drawback of doing the surgery after hours uh, when the ORs are down to a skeletal crew. 
And then there's also the competing economic game. So the OR will always talk about the cost of perioperative care at nighttime, but then the hospital will talk about the cost of bed utilization. If someone comes in with appendicitis at 8 p.m., I usually try to get it on that same day because that usually saves them a hospital day on the back end, but it's hard sometimes to get the right arm of the hospital to talk to the left arm of the hospital. But these are some things that we also consider. Sometimes cases that go after hours often end up with something like this. So we're going to talk about damage control laparotomy. Sorry, you guys can't see the title. I'm sorry it's taking this long. Um, these are two forms of uh, temp closure that we don't typically do here at Louisville. The left is an Abthera device, and then the right is some form of barbarism, you know, using clamps to close the skin. I mean, I don't know if this is surgery or Braveheart. Um, you can see that, you know, damage control laparotomy first was described in uh, the end of World War II by a British surgeon named Ogilvy. Yes, the same Ogilvy. Um, and then it kind of went away for a while and then came back into vogue in the uh, latter part of the last century. And that was primarily for liver trauma. So blunt and penetrating hepatic trauma. These patients got serial packing, removal of the packing, lavage, serial repacking. And, you know, it was kind of based on this, uh, the triad of trauma, hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy. But this has also been applied to general surgery, and we're going to talk about that briefly. So indications for DCL, damage control laparotomy, or attempt closure. So high ongoing trajectory of resuscitation requirements, concern for incomplete or, in, or about to be worse source control, um, concern for abdominal compartment syndrome. So for the students, when we cannot close the fascia without causing limited excursion of the diaphragm and ventilation and oxygenation uh, or potentially renal perfusion. Um, and then, you know, sometimes we feel like we have so much bowel that's either been bathing in stool or succus entericus, and we feel like there's a lot of potentially non-viable bowel, but we can't take it all out. Sometimes we'll, you know, temp close these patients and often wash them. I'll get back to that in a second and then bring them back in 48 hours or so and try to either get them back into continuity or get the belly closed under better physiologic conditions. So the pros of DCL in, abbreviates the index laparotomy. It mitigates physiologic derangements. It addresses contamination. You can see a, a setup here for DPL, which is a, a lot of research from that came out of the University of Louisville. It's basically directly resuscitating the peritoneal cavity with a peritoneal diacylate solution. And uh, I have found this to be helpful, not just with resuscitating patients, but also with um, performing some source control and some lavage of the peritoneal cavity. There's the potential to assess in an interval fashion, the viscera, so you don't have to take out more bowel than you need to. And then also getting the patient out of the OR early and alive will allow you to engage with family regarding next steps and goals of care potentially, because these are often very serious clinical situations. All that being said, I don't love temporary closures because they're pretty morbid. So higher risk of hernia, infection, fistula, some negative pressure therapy right next to the bowel is, is just physics. I always say fistulas are physics. Um, hypervolemia, so these patients stay on the ventilator. Ventilator means sedation. Sedation means high infusion uh, of crystalloid. And then all the things that come with prolonged ventilator dependence, uh, you know, pneumonias, deconditioning. So there are some critical care strategies that are thought to facilitate closure of the abdomen and reduce complications. So one of these is a, um, a lower volume infusate hypertonic crystalloid resuscitation approach. We often see this in polytrauma with brain injuries in the trauma world. Um, but also we cannot, you know, shoot that moon and forget that these patients have high ongoing sensible and insensible losses. So, you know, one strategy is to replace half to one of peritoneal losses and make sure you're keeping it on electrolytes. And then sequential fascial closure. So we have patients that get serial re-explorations. And I think if, you know, the abdominal wall is like a person, if you get it used to being lazy, it's just not going to come back together. So you want to try to Reapproximate that contour as much as possible, even if you can't close the abdomen entirely. Trying to sequentially close at each margin will help. But I think the best thing we can do to improve outcomes with these patients is to try to reduce and be more selective with our use of it. So, this is a propensity match analysis that was done a couple of years ago of 200 open abdomen cases in general surgery. These patients did worse with respect to complications, length of stay, and mortality. Propensity matching is a little suspect from a a research methodology perspective, but I do think it's easy to imagine that these probably are approximating reality. So, you know, in these situations, I think you really need to be careful with who you do temporary closure on because it's very morbid. One thing that we think about, and I talk about a lot with the residents is, you know, keep in mind what your end goals are and how you're going to get out of the operating room. If someone has a right colon perforation and they're very sick, well, what's better, a definitive ileostomy, get them out of the OR, get them extubated, or keep them on the vent for a couple of days. There's a high physiologic risk to that. Versus somebody, say, who has a proximal small bowel 
perforation or injury, those patients are going to be short gut and you have to put them back together. So these are some of the technical factors that we think about. But I think that this is something that the pendulum, again, appears to be swinging back in the direction of trying to do less of these and be more selective. But obviously, we do them pretty regularly because we have a lot of sick patients that need, need this approach. I think we're on our last topic. Yes. For the med students, we're going to talk a little bit about diverticulitis. Um, diverticula are outpouchings of the GI tract, um, often in the sigmoid colon. They're not true diverticula because it's not all walls of the colon. And they're thought to occur, you can see the intraluminal view here, they're thought to occur from low fiber diets, often seen in the Western world, seen at a much higher rate than, than elsewhere, uh, usually because we're not eating enough raisin bran, for example. Um, it's graded by the Hinchy classification, which is largely a, a historical data point, but still is useful to speak to each other about how severe it was. But Hinchy 1 is basically mild periclonic inflammation, and Hinchy 4 is stool in all quadrants of the abdomen. This is Henry Hartman. Probably the most famous surgical, surgical eponym is the Hartman's operation, with all due respect to Bill Roth, Whipple, and Halstead. Um, the Hartman's operation is something we kind of throw around a lot as residents. I think most of the senior residents know exactly what a Hartman's is. Um, a long Hartman's, a short Hartman's, a hard Hartman's, an easy Hartman's. But um, uh, you know, for the students, it's basically resecting the perforation or the diverticulitis in the sigmoid colon and then closing the rectal stump distally with suture staples, both, um, and then maturing an enchylostomy proximally. Henry Hartman was a surgical giant. He practiced at the hospital of Hotel Dieu, which is on the Pont Neuf in, um, in Paris, France. I was actually just there and neglected to get a picture, but this is one of the earlier pictures that they had. He did the first Hartman's operation in 1921, um, and it's probably the most famous French surgeon, arguably. So there, you know, the problem with Hartman's operation, though, is that anywhere from 50 to 75% of the patients are, that's the rate of reversal. So anywhere from 50 to, you know, 25% um, of the patients don't get their colostomy taken down. That could be a technically challenging operation with a low pelvic anastomosis, especially in the infirmed or the, the you know, patients that have a lot of the comorbidities that, that we would associate with getting diverticulitis in the first place. So we've been trying for years to find an alternative to uh, a Hartman's operation, and, and one, in my opinion, poor alternative is a laparoscopic lavage. So this kind of came in into popularity 20 years ago, and uh, we started to just wash the pelvis, reduce contamination, lay drains, and then treat medically from there with antibiotics. There's been several trials that have shown that at minimum, this isn't particularly helpful, and at maximum, it's dangerous. Uh, the Scandiv trial randomized about 200 patients between resection and diversion and lavage. Lavage was associated with reduced stoma incidence. That makes intuitive sense, but there was a high crossover rate and uh, the patients had recurrent disease and sometimes the recurrent disease was more virulent than the index episode. Um, and then there was uh, the Dalala trial, which was similar, but worse powered. And then there's, there's two arms of the ladies trial and the Lola arm was laparoscopic lavage um, versus usual care, which was resection and diversion. And this trial was actually terminated early due to safety concerns. And they thought that actually it wasn't safe to continue lavaging these patients. So I think the data are pretty clear that this is not a great option, uh, except in very select cases, which I've yet to find in my practice. Um, a better option is, is doing a pelvic anastomosis and then protecting that with a proximal loop ileostomy. Um, this sounds great because you basically put them back together and do the hard anastomosis and then protect that by not letting them stool past it with the loop ileostomy. Loop ileostomies are harder to care for in some respects, higher output. They are hard to slow down. If you guys have been on uh, our service lately, you know that more than anybody. Uh, but it can be locally reversed. And, um, you know, God gave us a lot more small bowel than colon, and it's a lot easier to, to do it there. The caveat is it's a good option when you can perform it. A lot of times we have, um, you know, blown out diverticular disease, low pelvis, really sick people. Sometimes not the best circumstances to technically get that anastomosis done. But when you can do it, these patients do better. The Diverti trial was done in 2017. It's a pretty uh, famous study in the general and colorectal surgical uh, circles. 102 patients, they randomized usual care to you know, the Hartmans to um, a coloproctostomy with diversion, comparable morbidity, mortality, but important, you know, basically every patient in the anastomosis arm was able to get reversed by 18 months, but only 65% of the Hartman's arm, which is basically what we've seen in the literature historically. So again, this is a good option. We do it pretty regularly on the service. I, I'd like to do it more, but uh, with you know the difficulty of some of the patient population that we see, 
Um, it's not for everybody, but I think when you can do it, the patients do a lot better, definitely the case. So that's all nine topics, just about done. Um, I think a big source of data that I provided for this talk and a, a, a recommendation for the students and the residents, I think the East uh, webpage that has landmark papers in trauma and acute care surgery is a great resource. I think any resident that's trying to improve his or her understanding of, of these topics on trauma or acute care surgery would be well served to, to read uh, a paper a day or several papers a week. I mean, it's just really high hitting uh, uh, stuff that I think will, will definitely serve you well as you move forward, uh, both students and, and residents. And that's really all I have. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take. Thank you, Dr. Martin. That was a really great talk. I, I, I learned uh, quite a bit uh, as well. Um, I would say that uh, for uh, the residents who take their general surgery uh, board exam, um, if you're uh, placing mesh in a, a clean contaminated case, your examiners may not be all up to speed with the latest literature. And if you leave synthetic mesh, you'll have uh, mesh infection and a fistula. Uh, so uh, you might want to consider how you'd answer that question. Um, when I was in training, there was no such thing as antibiotics for appendicitis. There was no such thing as subtotal cholecystectomy, at least uh, not something we ever saw. There was no such thing as damage control laparotomy. And these concepts have evolved over the past uh, several decades. Uh, and as you mentioned, the pendulum often tends to swing a little too far where we do damage control for things that we shouldn't. And uh, we and the bailout uh, for doing a subtotal cholecystectomy uh, it seems often a little too convenient. Maybe we should be doing a few less of these things. So I'd ask for your comments about how to balance the, uh, the use of, uh, of those kind of techniques uh, and, and versus when it's appropriate. Yeah. Um, first of all, on the general surgery boards, keep in mind, you don't have to manage the recurrence. So um, usually um, if they ask you, you know, they're really asking for a safe answer. So again, something that's avant-garde that you heard in a talk or, you know, read in a paper recently may not be the best answer on the boards because the boards tend to lag behind what's what's happening usually. Um, with your question, Dr. Rick Masters, I think um, a really, uh, you know, I think a good characteristic to have is to think outside the box and have multiple ways. You know, there's, there's method surgery doing the same thing over and over. So you have good outcomes and technical excellence. There's also you know, some heterodoxy that can be helpful too, um, by knowing how to do things multiple ways and having multiple approaches. And, you know, like in subtotal cholecystectomies, again, I think it comes down to patient selection. So if you have a, a thin young patient that has more years to benefit from having their whole gallbladder out and will do better with a, a coker incision, that's probably a better candidate than the 85 year old that has gangrenous cholecystitis that probably just needs the, the gallbladder that's necrotic to be resected. Um, but I think you need to be anticipatory of pitfalls with each approach and try to tailor it to the patient. The other comment I'll make is that at, at the beginning, you know, you, you referenced that we often are the victim of uh, transfers that um, our residents may not always appreciate and attendees may not always appreciate. Uh, and they consider those patients to be dumped upon us, especially on uh, when Friday night start cases that could be potentially managed at other hospitals that are transferring to us. But I will remind all of us that that's our bread and butter. That's your education, those patients, and, and University Hospital makes its living on the patients that other people can't take care of and other people don't want to take care of. And if anybody uh, is in a place where someone doesn't want to take care of them and they want to send them here, that patient's better off and uh, and so uh, while we grumble sometimes about uh, patients that we think were inappropriately transferred, your answer should always be when someone wants to trans you, transfer you a patient, yes, thank you, we're happy to take care of them because those are the patients for your education and those are the patients that we're here to take care of. Other comments, questions? Dr. Parra. Really talk, I think all those topics can be talked about in, in the, uh, their own discussion. 
I had a question you kind of thought about the robotic part. You know, one of the hardest things is engagement from administration to engagement from hospital staff because they just don't want to do it, they're not trained, et cetera. And I'm sure it's probably reminiscent to laparoscopic surgery from a ton of time on nights and weekends. And what really probably pushed that was data and literature. And so is there really any data or literature about doing robotics at night on the weekends? And, and a lot of you did necessarily is and that's what you know we yeah most of the case series and research that's out there on this topic is from surgeons that are paid by Intuitive Surgical to become total robotic surgeons. And as much as I believe in the technology when it's appropriately used, I also think that that is, that is not correct either. There are not, there should not be surgeons that do all the cases on the robot because not all cases are appropriate for the robot. Um, I think that there's just more to come on this. We just need to have more time with the technology as it gets, you know, ingrained into more surgeons and is being used more ubiquitously. All right, we're going to have to stop there. Thanks, Dr. Marshall, for an excellent straight around. I'm sorry.